talk today about imaging brain networks and psychiatry. And I thought I'd just start uh, historically and remind ourselves that you know, brain networks and psychiatry go back a long way. In fact, the first people to think about brain networks were in the 19th century. The anatomists, uh, psychiatrists and neurologists, mainly of the German-speaking countries. Uh, so on the slide I've highlighted Theodor Miner, uh, an anatomist who was one of the first to dissect the, the brain and see that under the cortical surface there was a branching central white matter that connected cortical areas. Um, and he was followed quickly by clinicians like Carl Wernicke, who is arguably the first uh, uh, man to have drawn a network diagram of a disorder, which you can see on the slide, a very simple sketch he made while he was a medical student showing how two particular cortical regions, uh, what we now call Wernicke's area in the superior temporal gyrus and Broca's area in the inferior frontal gyrus, and the uh, white matter connection between them, the arcuate fasciculus, those two nodes and the white matter edge between them uh, in uh, Wernicke's diagram uh, constitute a simple network and he, he recognized that disruption of that network could cause disorders of language like conduction aphasia. And even Sigmund Freud in the 19th century, who uh, we sometimes forget was originally a neuroscientist, uh, when he began to think about how the brain processed psychic material, uh, represented his uh, model uh, initially in the form of a network. Uh, the, the sketch in the slide shows a famous figure from his project for scientific psychology, where you can see a network of cells with some mysterious energy flowing through them according to uh, the process uh, that the, the, uh, the patient was experiencing at the time psychologically. So these ideas about brain networks, uh, anatomical brain networks at a macro scale, as demonstrated by Minot, at a micro scale, uh, as sketched by Freud, go back a very long way in terms of our thinking about brain disorders and psychiatry. But in the 20th century, something strange seemed to happen, which is that we basically lost sight of psychiatry as a brain disorder, perhaps following Freud's more psychological development of psychoanalysis, uh, away from its neuroscientific roots, we began to forget that uh, brain disorders uh, had a part to play in our understanding of psychiatry. And it wasn't really until the sort of second half of the 20th century, really the, the, the last few decades of the 20th century, as imaging became more available and we were able to look at brain organization uh, in patients um, more completely, that some of these ideas began to resurface. And what you're seeing on the slide, uh, or will see on the slide, is a meta-analysis of the structural MRI uh, studies that have been conducted in patients with schizophrenia up to about 2005, 2006. By that time, thousands of patients have been scanned. We can pull all these data and we can come up with some very robust and replicable results, which show beyond doubt that there is indeed disorganization of the brain in, in people with schizophrenia. The gray matter lesions, and it's not a single lesion, it's not like a stroke or a tumor, rather you have a distributed set of cortical regions which shows some reduction in uh, signal intensity, the thalamus, the insula, uh, the lateral medial prefrontal cortex and others are involved. Uh, that's a very strong uh, effect and it's accompanied as we increasingly use diffusion tensor imaging to understand white matter organization, we can see by a meta-analysis of those literature that the changes in gray matter are accompanied by disruptions of white matter too. Now these are analyses looking at the brain bit by bit, but they're telling us it's not one gray matter lesion, it's a set uh, of areas that seem to be affected in the cortex and it's accompanied by white matter changes too. The most parsimonious explanation for those observations is that when we're talking about schizophrenia as a brain disorder, we're talking about a disorder of network organization, large-scale networks, very much as Wernicke uh, first imagined them, uh, involving the interactions between multiple cortical areas mediated by white matter tracts. Now, <coughs> of course, uh, another big thing that's been happening scientifically in the last 10 or 15 years, is that in areas of science outside neuroscience, uh, mainly physics originally, there's been increasing focus on understanding network organization in general. 
And there are many new tools that we can apply to look at brain networks. And as the slide shows, people have already begun to look at network organization in nervous systems in various different scales and in various different kinds of organisms. So for example, you can take a very simple organism like the worm, Cynorhabditis elegans, and you can say, well, uh, each neuron in that system, I'm gonna describe as a node, and I'm gonna draw an edge or a line between those nodes if they're connected synaptically. We call that mathematically a graph. We've represented uh, the worm's nervous system as a graph, and we can make a similar graphical analysis of multi-electrode recordings from the cat, we can look at the uh, large-scale wiring diagram <coughs> of the monkey brain. And using DTI and functional MRI, we can begin to draw mathematically equivalent graphs, network diagrams of human structural and functional networks. Uh, and one of the remarkable things that I think you can see just by looking at the slide is that these networks are about equivalently complex, it seems, at all scales of space and time, and in these many different kinds of brain. Now, focusing a little bit more on the human brain network, I want to introduce a word that didn't exist a few years ago, connectome. This is a word that we've uh, begun to use increasingly to describe uh, the ambition uh, we now have to map human brain network organization at a large scale based on neuroimaging. <clears throat> using some of the mathematical te techniques I've already described. And as people have done uh, these sort of analyses, some quite consistent properties of the networks have emerged. For example, uh, they're typically small world. That means they have both clustered connections between uh, nodes, uh, but also a short path length. In other words, it's quite easy to send a message from one node to any other node in the network, even if they're a long distance apart physically. So that combination of high clustering, short path length is very typical of brain networks. They also always have hub nodes. In other words, there are particular brain regions that are uh, overconnected compared to the rest of the nodes in the system. Um, and you can see in the figure a, a map showing where in the brain those hubs exist. Um, it's also uh, true, uh, pretty consistently, that these networks can be broken down into modules. They have a kind of modular community structure, to use the jargon. And you can see in the slide how we've taken a brain network and we've shown it not in the usual anatomical space, we've shown it in a topological projection, which puts nodes close to each other if they're directly connected, regardless of where they exist in anatomical space, and you can see that network comprises three large modules and a few key hubs uh, that interconnect them. Those high degree hubs are sometimes uh, also often called collectively a rich club. And the, these properties uh, have been demonstrated quite consistently and we're beginning to see how those topological properties of the connectome of the human brain networks that we can uh, measure using graph theory applied to neuroimaging, that topological analysis links back in to some of the old anatomical ideas that we had from the 19th century. Um, and uh, we can see, as in the slide, for example, that the uh, hubs, the highest connected nodes of the network, are also the uh, regions of the brain which have the most long distance connections. So you've got certain brain regions highlighted in the slide in that color-coded map of the cortical surface, certain regions which are topologically important, they've got a lot of connectivity to the rest of the system, and they're also quite expensive. The connections to them uh, traverse long distances. It's an organization we see in the brain, but it's also uh, somewhat reminiscent of the organization of the airline network, where you have a few airports, like London Heathrow, for example, very high degree, a lot of flights going in and out, uh, and those hubs mediate most of the long haul traffic in the global airline network. A rather similar organization seems to uh, apply in the human brain network. What does this all mean for schizophrenia? Well, we're just beginning to find out, I think is the honest answer. Uh, I showed you some meta-analytic results of more conventional MRI analysis earlier we're not yet in a position to bring together such large amounts of primary literature 
on, on a network analysis. So we can't be as definitive uh, yet. But preliminary results suggest that schizophrenia, like a lot of other um, uh, brain disorders, may be particularly a disorder of network hubs. And I'm showing you <coughs> on the slide some examples of that. The cortical surface uh, rendering shows that the high degree nodes, the long haul connector hubs of the human brain network are rather more extensive in schizophrenia. There's rather more long distance connectivity between different modules of the brain network in schizophrenia. Uh, the segregation of brain regions into separate uh, modules is blurred by a greater proportion of long distance intermodular connections. It seems the connectome in schizophrenia is somewhat overconnected, somewhat expensively overconnected. Um, another way to think about it is it's relatively somewhat randomized compared to the normal brain uh, connectome. So that's just a preliminary result showing, I think, the uh, opportunity to apply these kind of modern techniques uh, to an understanding of uh, brain networks in, in psychiatry. So just to conclude, uh, I started historically because I think these ideas go back a long way. And I think uh, we can connect with them because of their deep historical roots quite easily when we think about psychiatry. What's exciting me in the last 10, 15 years is to see how new imaging techniques and new mathematical methods of network analysis are making it easier for us to quantify and visualize this complex network organization in the human brain related to other different kinds of networks in the world around us and begin to see that some of those preliminary insights of Carl Wernicke and others uh, can be justified when we look more closely. We can see indeed that there is evidence for disorganization of human brain networks in schizophrenia and other psychiatric disorders. Thank you.